Um, if you're here for the Scott Adams talk, you're in the right place. If not, now's the time to silently walk out. Um, I've, I see familiar faces out here, and I see a lot of unfamiliar ones. Um, I'm a friendly fellow, and uh, anybody wants to reach out and, and friend me on Facebook or start up a chat on email or whatever, I'm certainly open to it. Um, I, I uh, have met a lot of fans of my games over the uh, course of the last 30 years, and almost invariably all of them have become friends. So I, I look forward to making new friends. Um, which brings us to our first slide. I'm going to be sharing what my life journey has been, what's occurred to me while speaking with you today. It is a lot of stories from the past and, and some from the present, and many of them are going to involve God because he has been instrumental in my life. If that offends you, I am not offended if you leave. It's okay. The parts on God are going to be more towards the latter end than the former end, but his guiding and inspiration has been there throughout my life whether I recognized it or not. The inheritance, the gift. I truly believe that we're all born with gifts that God has given us. Uh, we may not notice them, but they're there. They're usually part of our passions, the things that excite us, the things that make us happy. And I'm going to take you on a journey of me discovering my gift, what I did with it, how I abused it, and how I later understood it better. So this is the title of the talk, as I said before, is this is, that was then, this is now. So I'm gonna to try to take you on a, a brief journey through my life, why I did what I did, and and uh, the interesting things that happened along the way. Okay, grade school. Okay, we all went to grade school. For me, this was back in uh, the late 50s, early 60s, and I remember taking a field trip to University of Miami, I believe, from uh, Miami, where I was growing up, um, probably second or third grade, and we got to go to a computer center and we got there, and what I remember, and it sticks in my mind, is there was a big room, and there was a hallway, and there was glass windows that we could stand here and walk by and look into the computer center while our teachers talked to us, and we see everybody working. I don't remember much of what the teachers said that day. I do remember one thing they told me, and that really stuck in my mind. My question to them was, this looks really cool. I want to go in there. They said, no, you can't. And my recollection is, as a kid, I was thinking, oh, yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first e exposure to computers. And really wasn't that much, but that memory, that memory really stuck with me. In 1965, the World's Fair was in Flushing Meadow. How many of you here remember it? Anyone get to go to it? It was over uh, in New York, okay. This was quite a while ago, and it was a big deal. <coughs> I think if you go over to Flushing Meadow today, there's still the Unisphere there, and even the Science Museum, I think, is still there. Yep, because I remember going in that Science Museum and they telling us, this is one of the two landmarks that are gonna stay behind uh, after they clear everything back out and restore Flushing Meadow. And I went back years later and found indeed it was true and went to the Science Museum and went, wow, they really need to update this now. <laughs> um, while I was there, there were a lot of interesting exhibits. Um, Disney was there. They were showing their first look at what animatronics, audio animatronics were, and they, all these computer-controlled robots singing, it's a small world. It's a small world. It's, you know, you sit on that ride after a while and you're either going to be singing the tune or sticking your fingers in your ears. <laughs> because they just keep singing it. That wasn't, that wasn't the exhibit that was the big deal to me, though. We went to a Ford exhibit and they let you ride in a car and I got to drive it, pretend, and they go through and show the world of automation as it was coming. And that wasn't the exhibit that was really important to me, though. 
IBM had an exhibit. And the way I remember it was uh, there was a long line that you had to wait on. When you got there, there were some sort of stadium seats that fell down out of this building above. You got in, you sat in the seats, and they lifted you up. They did a presentation. I don't remember the presentation at all. I think there was a line of TVs on the screen, and talk, they were just talking about computers, and whatever they said, I'm sure, was interesting, and it didn't stick. When we exited, we didn't go out the way we came in, which makes sense, because I remember when the, stair, when the seats came down, nobody was in them, so we were able to get in. So there was another exit. They took us down and funneled us down underground to a basement area where they had exhibits going. Um, and the exhibit that I saw was a tic-tac-toe program. And you could play against the computer on tic-tac-toe. So I went ahead, <coughs> got online, and waited my turn. And I got up there. It was my turn to play tic-tac-toe with the computer, by golly. And I looked up, and there was two big signs next to it that would light up. One said, uh, you lose. And the other one said, tie. OK, I asked the guy. Where's the I win sign? <laughs> and he says, you can't. What, what do you mean you can't? You cannot win against the computer. Oh, yeah? I'm pretty good. <laughs> I played. I lost. What stuck in my mind, though, was why could the computer not lose? We'll talk about that later. <sighs> OK. So we went from grade school now to the World's Fair, which is Around, this was middle school. Now I'm in high school, 11th grade. Um, I had a domineering Jewish mother. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. But let me tell you, it meant that when she had an idea for one of her children, that idea was their idea. And they better embrace it. Well, her idea for me was I was designated to go into medicine. So from 11th grade, I had already been accepted for pre, early enrollment in pre-med at University of Miami, skip, skipping senior, senior year. Um, it just didn't feel right to me. Uh, I was 17 at the time, 16 going on 17, and it was, it, it was not something I wanted to do. And I stood my ground with my mother, and for the first time ever that I can ever remember, and probably the last time ever that I can ever remember, I got my way. I did not have to go into pre-med. I could take my senior year in high school. And what happened in my senior year in high school was for the entire Florida system of, and I was living in Florida at the time, down in Miami, the uh, Florida system decided as an experiment they were putting a computer terminal in a high school to see what would happen. And that's what they did. I walked in one day to the Math Science Resource Center, and there was a teletype typewriter there, an acoustic modem, and a, um, a phone. And this was all new to me. Whoa, what is this stuff? And I walked over and talked to Mr. Nordmeyer. I still remember his name. He was the head of the department. I said, what is that? And he says, it's a computer terminal. I said, who is it for? He says, anybody. You can use it. I said, how do you use it? Yes, I don't know. <laughs> I said, OK, uh, where's the manual? There isn't one. Oh, cool. <laughs> the language that the terminal talked was IBM APL 360. I don't know if you know APL, but it's, it's all Greek to me, literally. It uses the Greek character set. It's a mathematician's language. You can take the determinant of a matrix with one command to give you an idea. It's not a, not a user-friendly language at all. I had no idea. I, this was my first exposure. So I started playing with it. I found that I could buy a manual at the University of Miami. OK. It cost me $10, and I paid it. And that was, that was actually some pretty major money for uh, a kid in high school at the time. So I, I, was, I think I was working as a car park at the time, a valet. So I saved up my tips and bought the manual. I read it. And I decided, once I did my type of Hello World, basically, what's your name? And it types it back. We did, the concept of Hello World didn't even exist at the time. But it, it was, once I played with it a little bit, it's like, OK, what do I want to do with this? 
Well, what I decided I wanted to do is write a tic-tac-toe program. <laughs> and I'm going to have the computer win. And I must have taken three or four months to do it. <clears throat> I got permission to come in to the high school early in the morning. They would literally, uh, I could get there when the janitors got there, what, around 6 a.m., knock on the door, they'd let me in, and I could then use the computer before regular classes. Then at night, I got permission to be locked into the school and leave whenever I wanted. Okay, <laughs> didn't get much sleep, but I sure learned a lot of stuff. Eventually, I did get the computer going, the game going, and I got it to play tic-tac-toe, and I got it to win all the time. And I was really, really proud of that. So I contacted University of Miami and asked them if I could have my game put in their public-facing uh, directory of the uh, APL uh, libraries so that other people could play my tic-tac-toe game. And they said, wow, that's really cool. Absolutely not. <laughs> Why not? Well, there's already one in there, and it's way better than yours. <laughs> what? Well, there is? And I took it, and I pulled it out, and I looked at it. My, my game took on the order of uh, uh, probably five to ten pages of, of uh, Selectric typewriter printed code. This one did it in one page. And I looked at it and learned a lot of stuff from a good programmer who understood how to use the language, how to properly use the, the functions. And ever since then, I've taken that to heart. I'm always willing to learn. I don't always know the best way to do something. I always don't always know the best language to use. I'm willing to learn, and I'm willing to learn from others. And that was a big deal, and that helped a lot. Okay, so we went through that. In the, in the uh, 70s, I got into uh, home computers. And my first home computer isn't even up here. It was a homebrew that my brother Richard built from bit slice ch chips uh, called the um, Imp, I believe, where they were uh, eight bits per slice. He, in, he built a 16-bit computer. I think it might have been four-bit a slice. Four-bit a, four a slice. Thank you. Ah, we got facts, fact checkers or people who have used it. This is even better. In, in any case, uh, he built up a 16-bit computer. My other brother was living with us. Uh, we were all three of us going to college at FIT, which is now known as Florida Tech in Melbourne, Florida and we were renting a house, and actually, we were, that's another story. <laughs> Wasn't renting a house, I actually bought it. Um, but in any case, doing the um, thing together, Richard built the computer, my brother Eric built a TV typewriter, uh, Do, a la Don Lancaster type of, of device, where we had a keyboard and we had a screen, and we could peek and poke into memory. So I proceeded to write a space war game you can actually see a video of it on my uh, personal web page at msadams.com in a sidebar there. <coughs> and as far as we can tell, it's probably the world's first 16-bit home computer game, considering there really weren't any 16-bit home computers at this time. So it's probably an easy claim to make. Um, but I had a lot of fun with it. It was all character-based. It was just a shooting game. Uh, things would fly across the screen, and you'd try to shoot it. And we called it uh, space Space Wars. Uh, e was for the Enterprise, K was for Klingons, and you just shot and it was a lot of fun. I wrote the whole thing in assembly language, okay, <coughs> because obviously there's no high level languages at the time available for this, but there was also no compilers or assemblers available, so I had to hand assemble it. I took each instruction, broke it down to hex, and then hard coded it in. I learned very quickly that I didn't write perfect code. I made mistakes. And that meant every time I had to change instructions, I might move things around. I might have to add an instruction in between something, and all my jumps were then bad. So I invented for myself a very common thing. I think other programmers would have done the same. I put the thing into modules that would do certain things, like one module would handle the keyboard. At the top of it, I put a jump table. And the jump table then jumped in to 
the address that uh, would correspond to where I wanted to end up. So anything that needed a label didn't go directly to that label, it went through the jump table. So if I had to move that by hand, I moved the address at the top of the jump table and everything properly linked. I actually kept the source code, the notebook that I wrote this in. You can see all the erasures and everything. And I remember my brother saying, what are you going to do with that? When uh, we were leaving college and taking off. And I said, well, I'm just going to toss it. I don't need it. He says, can I have it? I said, sure. You can read about what happened to that source code on my web page. But from what I understand, it went through the hands of a few collectors. And it seemed to garner in value as, as it changed hands. <laughs> the world's first 16-bit home computer game. OK, now we move into the um, 70s. And this is the beginning of what we called, actually, I'll throw one more. If I go too long, I may miss some things at the end. So I'm going to try to hit all the highlights that I want. But there's a lot of interesting things that happen. I'm just briefly going to mention another computer. And it was the first kit computer that I bought. It was called a Sphere just like a round globe sphere. Um, Mike Wise was the president. you got to read about this machine. It's gotten very little press. It's very poorly known. It was amazing. It was far better than the Altair Mitz that gets all the credit as being the first. But what it did was, was just awesome. And with that machine, which I, I did build myself, and then I realized this thing has no graphics. And I wanted graphics, so I literally invented the graphics card for the machine and built it and hand-wired it and made my own graphics card. Can you guess why I wanted to put graphics in? Games. Yes. <laughs> Bingo. And the game I wanted to write was Tank Wars. And so I did. And Tank Wars was in the arcades at this time, where you'd have a controller, you can pull back and forth to control it, and a fire button. So I actually made two boxes that could do that. And I invented the boxes. I had wires going across inside. So you were completing the circuit when you moved the copper to either one. And then there was a fire button. And I went in through the I.O. switches. And bingo, I had the controls. And on the screen, it was all black and white with one bit per thing. I had little tanks that went around. And you can play against each other. And I took a video of it. I don't have it today. And the reason is because Sphere uh, had their first annual what do you use your Sphere for contest. They wanted everybody who had a Sphere to tell them what they used it for. So I sent the video of the game in, and I won the first annual contest. Unfortunately, a year later, Sphere was gone. And with it, my submission and everything else. But it, it was kind of neat. All right, now we're finally <laughs> to the start. <laughs> that was the pre-start. Uh, we're now um, 1978. <coughs> Radio Shack, 1977, that, that time frame. Radio Shack came out with the, uh, uh, appli what we called, the homebrew people called, an appliance computer. You could buy it off the shelf ready to use. And I was looking at it. And they had the Model 1 in two different, they didn't call it a Model 1 because there was only one model at the time. This was the TRS-80 computer. They had two levels to it. Level one and level two. Level one came with a 4K Tiny Basic. Well, I had already played with Tiny Basic on my Sphere. I had gotten a, a copy of uh, Tiny Basic for the processor. The Sphere was a, pretty sure it was a Z80. Um, and uh, I, I knew Tiny Basic. I had fun with it. Uh, but the TRS-80 for level one was a Tiny Basic, Microsoft Basic. Not Microsoft. It was Radio Shack Basic, something. Then there was a level two, which was a 16K basic. And it came with a small, with a company, a small company out in Washington that was doing uh, some basic work called Microsoft. And I had heard of Microsoft basic and I wanted to try it. And I thought, okay, this sounds like a good machine. So I did end up buying a TRS-80 level two, 16K. And started playing with a new language. I love new languages. Uh, today I use C sharp. And, uh, Unity, and I, I love learning new platforms, new languages, new methodologies, and doing it just keeps expanding how I do things. Um, and I also love new things connecting to old. I, I had a great chat <coughs> with Thomas Cherry Holmes on FujiNet, and I'm getting a glimmer of a start of an idea of maybe there's a way to shoehorn some 
new stuff back into some old stuff, and everybody has, has fun. I don't know if it, it's possible, but it's exciting to think about. So I had the TRS-80, and the thing I wanted to do was I wanted to learn new things in BASIC. And the biggest difference I saw between Tiny BASIC and, and Microsoft BASIC was something called strings. And I, what the heck are strings? Well, strings are basically a way for a computer to understand uh, uh, alphabetic text. That's the easiest way to put it. Now, at this time, I'm a mainframe programmer, too. And I'm working for Stromberg Carlson. They were one of the first to bring out a digital central office for the phone systems. Before then, all the phones were electromechanical mechan switches. You've probably seen how those things work. Well, they were starting to come out with a digital switch. I was part of the team that was designing the software for that. Um, part of the reason I got that job was I used to work for, the, uh, uh, for RCA down in the Air Force Eastern Test Range. And I literally saved RCA's bacon at one point where they were going to lose a contract and I pulled some computer wizardry for them on their mainframe, got them the contract, and the guy who was in charge of the whole operations, uh, his name was Jeff Ruby, he was up in Patrick Air Force Base and we were scattered down in uh, Ascension Island and Antigua, so the, the, the range goes a long way. Um, basically, they're radar tracking stations that when a missile was shot, they would be tracking it, getting telemetry. They're also supporting NASA, uh, supporting Space Defense Command, and literally I had to get clearances to do some of the work I was doing. It was fascinating. But Ruby is a, a key part, which brings me another very quick short story. Um, because of what I did for the radar station in Antigua, I got the permission to do whatever I wanted to do with the radar station after hours. Well, I found a copy of Star Trek floating around that ran in Fortran that worked on the teletype. So I got it working on the Sigma 5 mainframe there, and I was playing Star Trek on the teletype, and I'm looking over at the radar screen. Star Trek on the teletype, like radar screen. Well, yes, I did. I turned a multi-million dollar radar station into a, a video game. I had Star Trek working on the radar screen. I couldn't share it with many people, but I got personal satisfaction doing it. So I had a great deal of fun with that. It gives you just a glimmer of what I was doing with my gift. My gift, obviously, was working with these electronic things and being creative. That's, that's what God gave me. And so I was exploring that gift and understanding it. OK, so now we've got the TRS-80. What am I going to do with it? I want to learn strings. What can I do? I wrote a small game uh, called Dog Race, where you bet on the outcome of a couple of dogs that are running across the screen, and the winner took all. It was a little game. I took it in a local radio shack and said, can I sell it here? And they said, sure, sell it for a buck. And might have sold five or six copies. It was a piece of junk. But I, I was excited. I was always an entrepreneur. When I was a kid, um, I turned our, our garage into a slot car uh, arcade where I would rent time <coughs> on my slot car set <coughs> to all the kids in the neighborhood, use the money to buy more slot cars and more stuff. So I was always looking for some way to raise a little bit of money on my own. So I had fun with that too. All right, so I've got this TRS-80. Um, I'm working at Stromberg Carlson. And somebody says, hey, there's a cool new game that they're playing on the mainframe. I was not a main allowed in the mainframe in the IT room. We all had terminals connected to the mainframe room for the deck. And they said the name of this game is Adventure. Oh, sounds nice. What does it do? Well, come here, take a look. And he sat down and he showed me here at the mailbox. And I just was blown away. Wow, what a concept. I went, I did my high school thing again, where I went in and I played the game in the morning up until the time I had to start work. And then when I left at night, I played the game till I had to go home. And I was married at the time, so it wasn't quite as late as I would have liked. <laughs> I played the game for a week and beat it. And got, you got the full 300 score. And then this one had the extra 50 points that you could do, which was exciting. And I did that. And I just had a blast. And it was so much fun. And then I got done and I go, Wow, it'd be so cool to have this experience on my TRS-80. 
because that, this is text. I'm dealing with text. I'll have to deal with strings. And I told my friends and colleagues at, at Stromberg what I was going to do. And that I had, keep in mind, I'd never seen the source of this. I had no idea. I didn't even talk to the IT department and just got permission to be able to access the game. So I told them I was going to do this, and everybody laughed at me. It's like, you're going to take this mainframe game and put it in your toy computer. Uh-uh, it's not going to happen. I said, well, no, I'm not going to take this game, but I'm going to write something like it. I realized, though, I had a challenge here because they were right. I didn't have the processing power, the RAM, or anything like a mainframe computer because I work in, on mainframes and I work on the micros and I, I knew the difference. So I literally had to develop my own language as I went along. I invented a interpreter that could understand the language. I invented a compiler that could compress the language. And then I had to write the game. So I had four pieces going all at once at the same time. And I wrote a game that I called Adventureland. And it was a salute to adventure. It, you start in a forest and you have treasures you have to pick up. Just like in adventure, you have treasures you have to pick up. So I was mimicking the concept that I learned from Colossal Caves. It was truly uh, eye-opening, and I learned to use strings. And I got the game working, and I got people playing it. They'd come over and play it, and as they played it, it gave me ideas of how I could change the game, and I made it better and better and better, and fine-tuned it and made it better until I hit a brick wall. The brick wall was, I had 16K. I, I, I had a cassette drive. I did not even have a floppy at this point. So it's like, okay, I've got to say the game is over. So I reached the point where I had, I think, 13 treasures. I said, okay, that's going to be it. I can't put any more puzzles in. I can't put any more treasures. I'm going to cut off at 13. I'm going to put a scoring system in. So when you get all 13 treasures, you have 100. Now I've got something done. So I took it to an 8-bit um, uh, group that was meeting in Orlando at the time, because uh, I, I had moved up to Longwood, which isn't really even in the same county as Orlando, but everyone, you're in the greater Orlando area. Um, so I took it there, showed it to folks, and I was able to sell tapes of it. And this was really cool. I, uh, I thought, wow, I'm onto something here. This is fun. People are enjoying it. Um, Softside Magazine, I think, was coming out at this point. And I may be wrong on this, but the way I remember it, Softside was about this big. It was not a large print. And it uh, had in the back places to put small ads, uh, classified. So I put a classified in for the game and started selling it mail order. And people would send in, I think I charged $14.99. People would send the money in. I picked that number because it sounded cool. Uh, <laughs> And uh, then one day got a call from Manny Garcia in a far, far off land that I had only heard of but never visited in a place called Chicago. <laughs> hey, I was from Florida. Um, and he wanted 25, I think it was 25 cassettes. And uh, he literally had to teach me that what wholesale was because it was, oh, 25 times $15, that's going to be, no, 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 that's not how you do it. You've got to give me a discount. I do? Why? Because <laughs> I'm going to resell it. Oh, OK, how much of a discount do I have to give you? Really, I was learning everything from the ground up, which is sad because when I went to school, I got a degree in uh, computer science with a minor in business. <laughs> and, OK, I didn't know this stuff. I should have. It shows how well that college education prepared me. As far as computing goes, I. I ended up guest lecturing some of the classes I was taking when I was an undergraduate because of the work I did. We had a, a mainframe downstairs, and I managed to be working in that mainframe department. That, there's too many side stories here. A anyway, to make this one short, upstairs in the computer lab was the computer for the students, uh, Honeywell DDP24. And you had to sign up, and you got a maybe 15 minutes, half hour a day, if you were lucky. Um, so what I did was I went downstairs. I wrote a simulator from the machine upstairs, wrote an assembly language uh, uh, assembler, and then I wrote my classwork on it. So <laughs> and the next semester, I turned that whole thing in as a project 
to, to the assembler class, and they were like, whoa, what did you do here? And that's why I was guest lecturing the, the classes that I was taking. OK, so I've got this game. I'm selling it, and now I've gone retail. Started a company called it Adventure International, and it started to grow. Um, the pictures here, that was an early picture of uh, the geodesic dome. That was one, two, three. That might have been the fourth or fifth building we moved into because we just kept growing. We literally built that dome for the company, three stories inside. Um, so the company was growing. Um, we were doing really nice packaging now. Oh, I forgot to mention, I sold him 25 tapes. He sent the money, the stuff went up, and he called back and he says, there's, I got everything, but there's one problem. Where's the packaging? I sent him just cassette tapes, not even a label on them, just cassette tapes. He says, I can sell these, but you got to get packaging. And uh, getting that packaging was quite a story, too. Uh, bottom line was basically we ended up using baby bottle liners with a business card clipped on top and a hole <laughs> drilled in it. But it was packaging and it could hang on a pegboard. So we went from there. So that was, that was the, my intro to appliance computers. I love the Terra 80 since it was my first appliance computer. It had great strengths and also lim limitations. There was no perfect home computer at the time. But I'm, I was very fond of this one. Um, its biggest limitations was the, there was no lowercase on the initial machine. And I actually researched it because that bugged me. And I found out that the ROM chip that they were buying was defective. They never admitted it, but they bought a batch of ROM chips where the capital A was in the wrong spot. It looked wrong. And so they, I'm sorry, lowercase a. So they turned off lowercase. Every other lowercase in there worked. So you can make a mod to the hardware and put a switch in and turn lowercase on, which was really cool. The problem is everybody else, if they didn't have the switch, wouldn't see the lowercase. So literally the first game time the game went out for quite a while, Adventureland was all uppercase. There was no upper lowercase. So if you ever see it playing with only uppercase, then it was on the original hardware and the original games, and that's, that's very rare. Because I literally had to go back later and rewrite stuff because I knew I didn't have upper and lower case, so I didn't care when I was programming, but later when I did, it made a, made a difference. Okay, now, I'm making it big, right? What happens? Okay, this one, Hi, Igor. <laughs> That's really me. That's really my hair. <laughs> hardly changed at all. <laughs> um, this was the limited gold. It was a very special edition that I brought out. That this, by this time, I had a dozen games uh, in the adventure series. Uh, they were all different themes, and they were doing very popular. And I thought, bring out a special edition of it. And I don't remember where I got the idea. And I said it would come with an autographed picture. So. That was the picture. <laughs> oh, I figured if they're looking more at Igor, they're not going to be looking at me. <laughs> um, and uh, we sold a lot. It was a, it was a, we sold out the entire run. It was probably the best thing we ever did. It came with a certified uh, number for each one. It came uh, with the possibility of winning a gold cougarand. We actually bought four gold cougarands and put them in the series for people to find. So that, that was just an add-on basis. So this was doing great. That's me in the Hulk. And we're going to get into him a little later. But there are some big things going on. Um, by this time, I was well known in the industry such that other companies were asking me to um, pitch their product, so to speak. Uh, so Instant Software had some good stuff, and I, I did like it. And they approached me and said, would you mind telling the world that you use it? Because I was using some of their business software. And I said, sure. And that worked two ways. One, it was nice, because um, uh, I think they paid us a small royalty. I don't remember. But two, it gave more exposure, which can't hurt. Uh, 
the more times your people say you're famous, you become famous. And that's a problem. Okay. This one a little faster than I wanted. The first one on the left, that is just a catalog of the programs we were doing. It wasn't just my games. We became a publishing house. We accepted programs to be published. And we had a big catalog of games. And, from what I, and we sent out catalog mailings. This was long before internet. So the people found out about us by uh, either seeing a catalog or seeing it in a computer store. Well, computer stores were very rare still. So mostly they saw it by catalogs. And so we, we compiled a, an incredible catalog list, and we would mail out catalogs to everybody who's ever bought anything of ours that registered. And from there, it would grow. And I've heard from people where they, when they were getting these catalogs, they looked forward to getting them. They started as black and white, and then they moved into color, and they got quite elaborate. OK, Scott Adams, the superhero superhero. This was actually approved and printed by Marvel. OK, what do you think that did to my head? <laughs> Hulk has nothing on me, I'll tell you. You want to talk about a big head? Yeah. I'm going to hit some highlights here. OK. Did, did anyone here get to hear Mike Tomachek? OK, a number of you did. Incredible. He gave the story of, of how, why, where, and when the VIC-20 came into being. And he had his fingers in a lot of that. It was an amazing, amazing thing that he did. Well, by this time, like I said, <laughs> I was well known. So I, I was contacted by Mike saying they were coming out with this new computer, the VIC-20, and they saw that I had put my games on a lot of other machines, and I had, because I was always getting new machines as they came out and figuring out how to get my game on it. Because keep in mind, I wrote my own interpreter, and I wrote my own language, so all I had to do was get that compiled uh, interpreter running on that machine one time, and I'd have my entire game set, because everything else then just came over easily. And most of the changes, I was either changing processor, 6502 versus Z80, because those were the two that were primarily used, or I was changing uh, input-output for the screen or for the, the uh, keyboard. There was no mouse, of course. Or maybe not, of course. There was no mouse, just know that. <laughs> OK. So Mike called and said, well, we're coming out with this new computer, the VIC-20. I said, oh, yeah, I've heard about it. And he said, how about you put your games on it for us? And I said, no. Nope. That, that was one machine I had already decided it isn't going to work. I'm not going to do it. Uh, what? What? Wait, wait. Why? What's the matter? I said, well, you only got 5K of memory. I need 16. It isn't going to fit. I'm sorry. Oh, is that all? Well, what if we put it in a cartridge? Ding. <laughs> <coughs> Just like he did with the modem. What if we put it in a cartridge? Yeah. Wow. That was revolutionary. Could it fit? They said they could give me a 12K, I think it was 12K cartridge. I'm pretty sure that's the, the size of it. And really, the game is, the majority of it is either the interpreter or the database, but it does need RAM to build the variables, to build the state machine of everything going on. I said, it might work. <laughs> And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to send engineer down to help you do the conversion. Oh, cool. OK. And he did. Um, two engineers actually came down over the period of the, uh, the process of the period was uh, Andy Finkel and Jeff Bruett. Both of them, young men, incredibly talented. And we worked very well together. And I think both of them stayed at my house at the time. We had a spare bedroom. Um, and we spent some long hours doing it. I think Mike said that we turned it around very quickly. I honestly don't remember how long it took. My recollection is it took probably about 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like forever. It was not an easy task. And just when I thought we were all done, um, we are literally within a couple of hundred bytes of getting this thing fitting and running. And it, we couldn't shrink it anymore. 
literally couldn't shrink it to do what we needed to do. Pulled every trick we could, compressed code as much as we could think of, and then it was either Andy or Jeff, and I wish I remember who it was, that came up with a brilliant idea. They said, you know, this cartridge has a bootloader. When you put it in, it automatically starts playing the game. I can take that out, and we can give them something to type at the, in BASIC that'll start the cartridge. I said, really? He said, yeah, let's try that. And it was enough room. I think we ended up with 20, 30 bytes to spare. So if you play a VIC-20 and you go, why am I typing in these magic numbers to start the game? That's why. It was not that I was trying to be mean or trying to confuse anyone or mystical. It was simply we had to do it to make it work. Um, that's Jack. That's Mike. John Mathias. Anybody here know that name? He was director of software at Commodore when I first went out there. Um, so basically, Mike turned me over to John. And John is the one who I worked with after that. Um, John Mathias was a University of Wisconsin professor who uh, left and went to work for Commodore. At this time, they were in Pennsylvania, um, right near Valley Forge. Um, oh, I don't remember the area now. But uh, I went out there and met with John a couple of times. And <clears throat> he was very instrumental for something that happens later. But I, we had a good relationship. We got, we got, it, got it done, and we got the game out. Um, Mike was wonderful to talk to. You know him. He's friendly, he's outgoing, and he's got a good heart. Jack is dead, and they say, you're not supposed to say anything bad about the dead, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> TI. Oh, yes, TI. Anybody have a TI-99? OK, we've got some fans there. I love the machine. It was the best internals of any of the machines I had ever worked with to put the game on. Once again, they came to me and said, would you put your games on our machine? By this time, sure, I'm getting used to this. Why not? Just keep them coming. OK, um, so tell me about your machine. And they did. Uh, so the basic game, to get it to work, for the regular 12 uh, classic games, was a, I had my interpreter in a cartridge. They were not going to use a cartridge for each game. They said, oh, way too expensive. We will just have the interpreter in the cartridge, and then to get it to fit, your databases will come on cassette. They may have also come on floppy. I don't think so, but I don't, don't actually remember. So you, you got the game, and you got one cassette with the cartridge, and it was Pirate Adventure. So that's what came, and then you could buy the other 11 games uh, as, as cassettes. That was good, but that wasn't the end of it. They said, we want something special, something that's only for Texas Instruments. Nobody else gets it. So if you make it, it's for us, and it's going to be exclusive. Whoa, this is going to cost you. Hmm. They agreed. OK. So. <coughs> The game was called Return to Pirate's Island 2, because they were doing um, Pirate Island, and I thought this would be a good segue. So this would be the second half of it. It would help the two, the, cart the independent cartridge and the classic games play together. And then the other thing was, because it was going, they, they wanted it to be on a cartridge, and they wanted it to be graphics, so this was, this was a graphical adventure running on the cartridge. And as far as I know, it's probably the first graphical text game running on a cartridge that was ever made. Um, probably the last, too, because <laughs> it doesn't really make sense to do it. But anyway, that's, that's how it came out. To get the graphics in, this was long before the JPEG standard came out. And we had problems trying to figure out how we were going to press, compress the graphics. And we had tried some of the simple compression screens that were out there, and it just wasn't working. So I came with a, up with a system that was labor intensive, but memory um, um, 
compatible. What I did was I invented a graphic set for the, the artists that they could choose from. And then we could add symbols to it. So basically they were doing, all their art is done from tiny atomics that, they, that we assigned a number to. So basically we're doing pre-compression of, of the pictures. And it worked. And uh, you can see it because the game's still out there. Matter of fact, the only classic machine I currently own is the TI-99. Um, I, I just, I loved it to death, the internals. They were great. You hear me keep saying the internals. <laughs> the externals was another story, unfortunately. And if you were also here with, <coughs> during uh, Mike Tomachek's talk about Commodore, Tramiel had it in for TI. Oh, did he have it in for TI. And he really shot them down. Um, and they shot him down. <laughs> Shoot out at the OK Corral, except everybody dies. Um, what basically happened was TI, their $1,000 machine suddenly selling for $50 to $80. And this started the crash. But we'll go into that more. Oh, and the reason I kept saying the internals were great, they were. It was a, really, it was a 16-bit internal computer. The external was done by a separate division of TI than the people who invented the hardware on the internal. And what they did to that was a real shame. When I was developing, um, I didn't have the expansion bay because it didn't exist at the time. I had the TI there, and then I had the, the, all the things I needed daisy-chained out. And you had to have an eight-foot table to put all the peripherals that would plug into the one next to it, fixed plugs. So if you didn't have desk space, you weren't going to be using it. Uh, the chiclet keyboard. Oh, when will they ever learn? Well, they did. The 994A came out, and that replaced it. But unfortunately, the mistake was made early, and it got a reputation. So, so it's not just internals that counts. Everything has to go together. <clears throat> OK. Marvel, Hulk smash. More fun than should be legal. It was. Again, I got called. I didn't seek out. I got called by Marvel. By the way, I also got called by movie studios, too, Buckaroo Banzai. That's not even in, in the presentation here. But we did the only authorized video game for it. Um, actually, I didn't even do that one because I didn't have any bandwidth. I was so busy working on Marvel um, that I gave it to some of the people at the office, and they did a wonderful job. Uh, the Buckaroo Banzai adventure game is a lot of fun, and they get the credit. So back to Marvel, get a call from a fellow called Joe Calamari, uh, who has an office in Manhattan, another uh, far off distant land. <laughs> and he was saying that they, wa they wanted to get, they heard about computers, they heard about home computers, and they heard about home games, and they wanted to get their characters into that. And Joe said he had asked around, talked to a lot of people, and everybody said, talk to Scott Adams at Adventure International. Oh boy, <laughs> did my head grow another size. Um, it's sort of like the Grinch with his heart shrinking. Oh, my head is growing. OK, I said yes, of course. It was incredible. It was fun. I got to go up to Manhattan. I met with uh, Jim Shooter. He was the uh, uh, editor then. Um, uh, the, I met with some legendary writers uh, and inkers. Um, and basically, I got the rights from them to do whatever I wanted to do. The only caveat they had was they had to, if there was any artwork, they had to vet it and make sure it was approved. Other than that, I could do anything. Wow. So I, I said, this is great, but I, I want to do it right. I really do. Um, do you have any, anything that you can give me? Do you have writer's Bibles? Anything that goes, that you're using? And they said, no, but we're about to release something brand new. It's not even out yet. It's just in inking. We're calling it the Marvel Universe. <laughs> and it contained all their characters and a synopsis of each one. Wow, what a treasure. So I got that, and I was able to read it and use it as inspiration for what I was doing. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I got was I asked Joe, would he give me a subscription to every book that they were publishing? 
He said, every single one? I said, every single one. I want to, because they were, at that time, you could get a subscription to Marvel Comics, and they would come to your home. So I got a subscription to the entire series, and they would come in. And I'd have a stack this big sitting on top of my computer, and I read every single one while I was working. I'd work, and when I needed a break, I would take down a comic, and I would read. And I did this for a reason. I wanted to envelop myself in, in the license to understand it. And I did something similar later with Redwall. Um, so the game is, is coming along. Uh, the game that I chose for the first game, they said, okay, so what are you gonna do now for the first game? And I said, I'm gonna do Hulk. And I said, Hulk? Yeah, Hulk is strong, he's a good character, but you know, Spider-Man's our, our number one seller. I said, yeah, I know, that's why I'm doing Hulk. Okay, explain. Well, I'm doing Hulk first because I wanna get Spider-Man right. I wanna make my mistakes in Hulk. So Hulk came out, it's not my best work. I did make mistakes. Um, it's the last of my two word sentence uh, parser. It's the last game that used verb noun. With Spider-Man, I expanded and took full sentences. So that, that was a big change. And also the, the gameplay wasn't as smooth. Besides not only doing the games, they gave me permission to write a comic book that was going to go with each game. So I made up a series and I made up a name. I called it Quest Probe. And the comics are still available. And from what I understand, I was told by a, a friend that of all the comics and licensing that Marvel has ever done, the work that I did with the Quest Probe series are the only ones that ever became canon. They are part of the Marvel Universe, my characters that I invented. There are characters in there. So, Whoa! I can't carry my head around anymore. <laughs> it was fun, though. Okay, we're back to Jack. <laughs> okay. Well, does anyone remember that Mike mentioned that Jack had a, one of his philosophies was make every penny feel like it's your own. And he owned all the pennies. He did not like to see pennies going out. So, he knew about this deal I got with Marvel. And his thing was, they could do it better. So he convinced me and Joe Calamari and all of Marvel that Commodore was much bigger and they should be publishing the games instead of Adventure International. I'd still write them but they would have the exclusive right of selling them. And if they should fail, they had an iron tight contract with large payoffs if they missed. Whoa, okay. A lot less work for me, get a lot more money, how can I lose? When I saw the first package for Spider-Man, I knew I was in trouble. You guys saw what uh, Mike put out, or if you haven't seen him, the VIC-20 cartridge art is beautiful. If you get a chance, take a look at what the Commodore 64 cartridge art for the Marvel series looks like. It, it's, it's, it's sad. And it was more than sad. They, they didn't even come close to meeting their commitments and their promises. They literally had to buy out of the contract. Um, and they did, and they paid, they paid 10 cents on the dollar of what they promised to pay if they were buying out of the contract. So I went up there with the Marvel lawyers and we negotiated. And it is, I didn't realize that at the time, but it is typical of the way Jack worked from what I'm hearing what Mike said. Because basically, they got us down even lower and then let it come back up just a little bit to make us feel good. Oh. <laughs> okay, a side effect of being with Marvel. I was up in uh, Manhattan at their, their uh, uh, 
world headquarters, might have been Park Ave, I'm not sure now, I honestly, maybe it was Madison Ave, I don't remember where they are. But wherever it was, I had a great meeting with Jim Shooter, um, Joe, and I'm leaving, and as I'm leaving, the receptionist says, Scott, come over here. Scott, you know Harlan Ellison, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I know of Harlan Ellison, who didn't at the time. For those who don't know, he was the infant terrible of Hollywood. He was the one that turned a lot of thinking around about science fiction and fantasy, and he was a major shaker and mover that moved Hollywood more towards our world. Okay, so anyway, she said, well, we're having a surprise 50th birthday party for him tonight. Uh, would you like to come? Sure. <laughs> and so I did. And there was Harlan. I think I got to talk to him for about five seconds. Um, he is an, in, he, his energy, he is like a giant dino, he, he's a Tesla coil, okay? The energy that comes out of him, and he is, he's got six conversations going at once with a dozen people around him. That's not me. I'm, I'm more geek under the table. I'm up here doing this presentation. I'm gonna crash after this and probably not be seen for a couple of weeks, okay? <laughs> Many of you could probably appreciate that. Harlan's the flip of that. He is just incredible energy. But I did get to meet him um, and didn't really get to socialize with him there. George Takai was at the party. And I honestly, at the time, I had some good conversations with him, and I did get to socialize with him. And when I'm talking, one of the first things I noticed when I went up and started talking to him was how big his head was. Huh? What? what? What are you saying? Well, I just looked at him, and his head's gigantic. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about my gigantic. That's invisible. His, was, his head is really gigantic. And you're telling me, no, it's not. Remember, I grew up in the 60s watching Star Trek on an 11-inch television. <laughs> really, my mind had fixed his head as that size. <laughs> when I saw him in person, he was this giant balloon version of Sulu. It was really weird. It gave me a lot of insight, though, into, into human condition. Wow. So we had some good conversations. I honestly felt, by the end of the night, that he was trying to pick me up. I'm serious, and I, uh, this, was, this was back in the last century, so it was really weird. Found out later he has come out, and um, he is uh, uh, not straight, and, but I didn't know it at the time, and so <laughs> it, it was just an interesting observation. I, this wasn't important, though. What follows, this one, this one was something that changed my life. And I met somebody else, Isaac Asimov. I'd been reading his works since I was a kid. And I appreciated everything he did, iRobot, Foundation, the whole series. I was even reading PsyOps that his wife was writing, which wasn't quite as good, and she goes in a different direction. She's not Isaac. I had never met him before. I know he was supposed to show up at one a convention in Chicago and he didn't make it. I was at that, that was the, like the only time I was ever at a convention, and, but he had a heart attack. He wasn't dead, but he couldn't travel and he didn't show up. He did show up. And when he came in the door, I was the first one he saw, the first one he talked to, and I went like, oh, my heart. And he walked over, he said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, no, really, and you know it. You know how big a fan people are of you. And he says, yeah, I know. OK. Let's see if I do this maybe out of order. Yeah. The next day, it was a great party. Uh, du Diane Duane was there, and I didn't even know who she was at the time, because as I was leaving, a young woman picked up a book off the chair, and it was a Star Trek novel. I looked down at it, and I said, oh, did you bring that to read? She says, no, I'm the author, and I wish I had talked with her. I felt so bad in retrospect. Um, 
Trouble with Tribbles. You know who wrote that? Yep, David Gerald. He contacted me when I, had, when I was at my peak about a possible collaboration. I wish that had worked out. That was really cool. But we shared a lot of uh, close connection. Because it turned out there was a, uh, he, had, <coughs> he had an interesting growing up time. And it, it, it uh, impacted him. Um, so back to Isaac. The next day, I'm visiting at a local convention that's going on. It's sort of like this retro event uh, convention, but it wasn't retro at the time. <laughs> future retro. <laughs> yes, a future retro. I like that. Um, and they also had a comic section, and it was, it was eclectic. And it was in the uh, first floor convention of a hotel. And, and we had some vendors there that were selling Adventure International products, which is why I was there, just to stop by, say hello. <laughs> and while I'm there, I'm about from a distance from here uh, to the back wall twice. I mean, it's a big ballroom type area. And there are, were two large double doors that open, a, a large platform, steps down, a platform steps down. So you can picture this as a sunken ballroom, a, a extravagant area to come in on. And so I just happened to glance up and I looked through the door, in walks Isaac. Oh, that's cool. And I watched him. He came in, he just sort of walked in, then he looked around, and he just stopped. What is he doing? What's going on? He just stopped and looked. Suddenly, somebody said, there's Isaac. And a mob enveloped him. I watched him. He started to glow. He was feeding off the fan adoration. He was, I hate to say this, he was so insecure he needed that fan adoration. And I realized this is not one of us. No matter how much you put up on a pedestal is not a perfect person. Not one of us. Don't put me up on a pedestal, please. Unfortunately, I was up on a pedestal and I had one of those bobbleheads. <sighs> got me thinking. Nineteen eighty three was a very interesting <laughs> year when it all went down, down, down. You if you were in Mike's um, uh, presentation earlier, he talked about how part of this was caused by Commodore and part of it by TI, by their, their uh, dueling, basically, or whatever you want to call it. It, it was sad, but it, it hurt a lot of people. Bottom line, though, there was too many games, too many systems, not enough consumers and too many people trying to make money off of a, a fixed stream. So, <clears throat> and it hit us. It hit us big. <laughs> it hit us really big. This was the end of Adventure International. We could not weather it. We had no outside investors. We were totally self-funded. My wife and I owned the company, and that was it. And we just didn't have the resources to, or the smarts to figure out how to get through this. Could it have been done? Absolutely. Um, but it didn't. We didn't survive. We closed the doors. You know, Adventure International was, was over. And to me, it was like my life was over, because I had put so much for so long into this, and I was washed out. I was a complete failure, and I didn't know what to do. Washed out, divorce, 
bankruptcy, failure. Other than that, things were great. <laughs> God talked to me. And I'm being very literal here. He talked to me, not with words, but through actions. I was so low, I didn't know where to go. Somebody invited me to go to a, um, a church camp meeting. Okay, I said, I, as a kid, used to go to camp every summer. And when I was a teen, I was a nature counselor. Um, I used to wrestle alligators for a living. I mean, literally. And so I, yes, let me get out into it. I didn't have to go to church, right? No, 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 just come, come to the campground and just be out in nature, have peace. Because they saw what I was going through. Okay, I'll do that. I went there, and when I got there, I found out that they were having a guest speaker, and she was a survivor of the Holocaust, and she was going to be telling her story. Being raised Jewish, I lost a lot of my family that I never met to the Holocaust. My family got out. The majority of the extended family did not and were never heard from. So the Holocaust meant a lot. It was hurtful, it was a wound that was still open, and I was interested to hear it. What I heard that night, it shocked me to my core and totally confused me. It, she gave a testimony of surviving the Holocaust and turning to Jesus. And I'm going, that's insane. She is so, so brainwashed. But I listened, and I thought, and I listened, and I took it back with me. So later, I literally went, okay, I'm always willing to learn new things, and I know I make mistakes. Is there something I need to learn? Let me at least research this, and I'm going to put it to the test. So I went into a Christian bookstore, which I had never, ever stepped foot in, because I wanted to get a Bible, a Christian Bible, one with the New Testament, because I was raised with <coughs> never having read the New Testament, not even knowing what's in it, other than stay away, it's dangerous, don't read it. <coughs> I had a Jewish mother. What? I was bar mitzvahed when I was 13. I was confirmed. I went through a, a, a very strong religious upbringing, went to Hebrew school. Okay. But I wanted to put this to the test, so I wanted to try to understand it. So I went in, I said, I'd like a Christian Bible. Can you sell me one? Oh, sure. Which one do you want? <laughs> There's only one Jewish Bible. What do you mean? Which one? Give me the Christian Bible. He took me to the wall of Bibles. He said, pick, take a pick. And I looked at him, I said, There's a small one. <laughs> It was. It was a small pocket Bible. And, they, and the salesman saying, it has the words of Jesus in red. And I said, oh, that's cool. <laughs> I'll take this one. So I took it home. Before opening the book, I said, God, I'm, I'm putting you to the test. If you're really there, I am seeking you, but you've got to prove yourself because I don't believe you're there. You've got to prove yourself in a way that I know you're proving yourself. It's got to work for me. So I opened the Bible. New Testament, okay. I said, okay, I'm just going to randomly open here, and I want to read something Jesus said. So I'll look for red. This is cool, red letter Bible. So I open it, and I start reading. <clears throat> I start reading something, and it's the Lord's Prayer. Okay, wait a minute. Whoa, I know this prayer by heart. How the heck? Jesus said this? I thought this was something from the Old Testament. How the heck do I know the Lord's Prayer? And thinking back, when I was in elementary school, they had not passed the no prayer in school laws. And I'm pretty sure I have a second and third grade teacher to thank for reading this every morning before class. I knew it. I knew it by heart. The only thing 
the New Testament I knew by heart. And I went, Whoa, okay, that was weird. <laughs> so, uh, put that thing away. It's dangerous. And I slept on it, and I thought, okay, coincidence happened. That was a coincidence. That was not God talking to me. Yeah, I, I know a coincidence when it hits me over the head. So just to prove it, next day, I'm going to do the same thing again. So I had the same prayer. Open the Bible. I'm going, okay, there's the dangerous section. I know where that was. I'm just going to open randomly somewhere else, read red, and see what it says. The Lord's Prayer. Again. Okay, something's going on here. I need to check something. So the next day, I asked some Christian friends. The Lord's Prayer, um, it's in the New Testament, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's in there like a dozen, 20 times, right? Oh no, no, it's only in there twice. <laughs> wow. Right now I can feel the Spirit. Literally can feel it. I've started being able to feel the Spirit in the last few years. There's a statement in Colossians that says, you can only say Jesus is Lord through the Spirit. And if you can, with your mouth, say, Jesus is Lord, you have the Spirit. And when I started saying Jesus is Lord, I could feel the presence of the Spirit and understand it. And now, just now, I felt the presence, even though I wasn't saying it. So at that time is when I became a professed Christian. And that changed my life. Um, do with it as you want. For those of you that have a similar experience, I expect to see you in eternity with me and I want to spend a lot of time with you. For those of you that aren't there, that's your choice too. If you ever want to discuss or have any questions of a theological nature, I have answers for myself that satisfy me. I'm willing to share them, and they may not satisfy you, and I understand that. Or you may not even want to ask, and that's okay. But I want to say this was a turning point in my life. There is indeed a bigger picture. And it's not over yet. Now, this is kind of the sad part, because when I normally give this presentation, my wife's here. And um, BCF was generous enough to say they were going to fly both of us up here, take care of our expenses, so she could be here too. Um, she had to bail. She is uh, burnt out on doing these. She's also burnt physically. She has health problems that she is fighting. So for any of you that believe in prayer, I'm asking you to pray for Roxanne because she can use your prayers. You can never be too prayed for. So just, just letting you know. But basically what happened was I remarried. Her name's Roxanne. And next to Jesus, she's the most important person in my life. He and her together have helped me to improve. In many ways, I'm still the same tactless, idiotic pain in the butt that any of my employees back in Adventure International days can tell you about. I probably outjacked Jack Tremille. <laughs> Not easy. I was a jerk. I really was. Uh, I probably still am, but now I don't think I am, so it's. <laughs> Okay, the inheritance. This is a game that I came up with around the turn of the century, around 2000. And it was going to be a game that fits all these things. And I actually started on it and did it in spurts over 10 years and really got nowhere. Um, it's an adventure game. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, and text adventure, audio. Okay. I did finish. I did finish the inheritance and I did bring it out. I also sold another game during that period. Remember Return to Pirates Island? Well, it became Return to, Return to Pirates Island 2. I went ahead and re released it on PC. TI was gone. The exclusive clause is long gone. 
So that was a game that I did just to see if I could get my engine working in more modern day setting from what it had been in. Uh, so I did it in uh, Visual Basic 6. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hey, back then that was a cutting edge. Um, so the Inheritance came out. It's a fun game for those who enjoy it, and it's an irritating game for those who don't. Um, it, there was a limited edition that I sold for a while, and then I withdrew it from the market, so it's not even available currently. Uh, in special cases, I will release copies to people who want to play with it. I would really like to get it back up to a quality I think it should be at, but right now, it's out. <coughs> CGDC. Stands for Christian Game Developers Conference. Is there such a thing? Yes, there is. Uh, they meet in Portland, Oregon. And I had been invited 2015. Yep. And I turned them down. Wasn't interested. I was, uh, by the way, during this time, oh, I totally forgot about uh, uh, John Mathias. Uh, after the crash and my company folded, I went to work for a small uh, uh, independent insurance place, uh, worked there for a while, got let go, tried to get a new position, and tried to get a new position, and tried to get a new position, sent out 50 resumes. They all came back overqualified. I had run a multi-million dollar company, they didn't want me. They really didn't want me, because I wanted a programming job. So, I was stranded. Literally, for six weeks trying to find a job, going lower and lower, ate through all our savings, we were at rock bottom. My wife said, you know, we really haven't prayed about this. Oh yeah, <laughs> we haven't. And so we did. We went down on our knees, and we had a prayer for my employment situation. Literally, as I got up, the phone rang. Wow. Okay, that's weird. Went over, answered it, and said, hi, who's this? This Scott Adams? Yeah, yeah, this is Scott Adams. Ah, oh, good, I've been trying to reach you for months. This is John Mathias from, remember me from Commodore? Whoa, yeah, what's going on? Turned out, John had come back to Wisconsin, come back to his roots, left Commodore, and he started a new company. He had five or six employees, and he'd been trying to fill in the ranks, and he wanted to know, would I be interested in coming to work for him? Wow. Only problem is he's in Wisconsin. I go, that's great, John. Yes. He wanted me to come help run his company into the ground, just like I did Sorry. mine. No. <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted me to come work for him. But I said, that's great, John. Uh, where's Wisconsin? <laughs> Moved up to Wisconsin, uh, and I found out something about myself. I had lived on Ascension Island off the equator. I'd lived in Antigua. I'd lived in Miami, lived in Orlando, and now I'm in Wisconsin. And I found out I hate hot. <laughs> I loved Wisconsin. I love the one week of summer we get. <laughs> I actually love minus 15. We went out the first year not knowing any better. Oh, it's minus 15 out there. Let's go sledding. <laughs> Introduction to Frostbite 101. <laughs> OK. Uh, so anyway, up in Wisconsin. So I got the invitation 2015 to go to Portland to be at the CGDC convention to speak. Um, this was the first time ever that I had gotten an invitation anywhere to talk about the stuff that I had buried. I had buried it. It's dead. That stuff is over. There's no interest in it. Though over the years, when the internet became alive, I started getting emails. And they were emails from people who remembered my games and they wanted to say thank you. And it was like, whoa, OK, this is cool. Uh, you're welcome, I guess. You know, I really wasn't doing this for you. I was doing it for me to get rich. But <laughs> seriously, that was my motive. God used me during that time because some of the emails I got were so touching. They were, they were literally deathbed con 
confession type things where people were saying they played my game with their mother as she's dying. She said, bring in the TI so we can play that pirate adventure again as a family because it meant so much to them. Some cases there were kids where their parents were going through divorces and the game was their shelter. They would jump into the game and shut out the world. Others would say that the game was inspirational to them and helped them find their, their path in life. There are a number of very large corporations today that are in the game industry that their founders have written me and said I was the reason they started their company. And God was using me. God was using me during that time and I didn't even know it. I was an atheist. He, he said he can use a donkey. And believe me, I was fitting that rank very well. I was that donkey. Okay, so I get an invitation to speak at CGDC. And it's like, oh, anyone know John Romero? Great guy. He sent me an invitation once to come to a party he was having in California uh, for his, quote, heroes that he wanted to um, uh, meet and talk to. And I turned him down because I honestly thought the only reason he was inviting me out there was he wanted to look down his nose at me and say, ha ha, I succeeded, you failed. That's what I thought. Don't put me on a pedestal, folks. I have got clay feet. And every one of your heroes that you have on a pedestal, they have clay feet too. Keep that in mind. There's no perfect person. Um, so anyway, this invitation from CGDC is, forget it, I'm not going. Well, well, they're going to be laughing at me. That's what they want me to come out. The next year, they invited me again, 2016. And it's like, I made the mistake of telling my wife. Oops. <laughs> she talked it over with our daughter, our, our oldest. Oops again. They both said I had to go. It, they were the epitome of the Jewish mother <laughs> as a wife and daughter. It's like, no, I'm being gang. OK, I'll go. So I went. It was, a, it was an amazing experience. So 2016, I went out to CGDC. I literally gave the opening keynote speech. Um, it was funny, because I'm sitting there in the audience, and I came in late, and it was in an auditorium, and I had my hat on, and I just sort of sat back, and they, they start off with a talk about the history of gaming and stuff. One guy was just going, doing it, and they said, then there's going to be this Scott Adams fellow coming. <laughs> And later, it's like, but anybody see him? He hasn't showed up yet. And then I wave my hand. It's like, oh, no, we've been talking about you. OK, so the talk that I gave that day was literally a version of this talk up till that time period. Everything you're going to hear now is going to be past that time period because it wasn't part of it. This was the group at CGDC that year. Great people, made some new friends. A lot of, a lot of wonderful people. And there's Roxanne. You can see her right down there. And there's me. Well, we had a wonderful time. And then Clopas came along. Oh, that was interesting. Redwall. Redwall, we'll get into that in a minute. Redwall caused us to start Clopas. And Clopas is a God-given name, literally. Myself, my wife, and two others from the conference came together in a prayer session to try to name this new company that my wife and I had determined we were going to start up. I felt God was tapping me on the shoulder and saying, you need to start something. So we needed a name. It, it was not going to be Scott Adams. It was not going to be Saga. That's too much me. By this time, my bobblehead had been knocked off. It was back to normal size. This, this, this company name had to reflect something different. So we're setting up parameters. What are we going to use for a name? Well, it should be five or six letters. It should be easy to spell. Um, it should be something you can type into the internet and it's not available. It's not really being used. And it should be something that 
uh, it doesn't accidentally send you to a porn site either. So seriously, right? that can happen. So we're sitting there playing with acronyms and throwing ideas around. And then my wife says, you know, how do you usually get an answer from God? I go, oh, yeah. Normally, for me, I go to the Bible. I read the Bible and get connected. So they are, while they're continuing talking, I pull out my Bible, and it's just like my old one, it's pocket size. <laughs> Literally, I, I do have a pocket Bible in the phone, and I just opened it without looking, and I'm flipping pages without looking, but just back and forth like this, random. And then I stop, and I read. And I read, Jesus is on the cross, and at his feet is Mary, and Mary of Clopas, and, and then I stop. Mary of what? Clopas? Clopas, what's that? Wow. Five or six letters, okay. Easy to spell, cool, but is it available on the internet? Okay, quick. Web search domain, yeah, nobody's using it. What does it mean? Okay, so I start looking and there's commentaries and things that they say Clopas might have been a place, it might have been a person. Nobody is really quite sure. Okay, but what does it mean? So I did a search and I found a site that claims to give out mystical names of words. And I read, and Clopas was in there because the web search pointed me to it, and I read, Clopas, glory to the Father. Okay, God picked the name, Clopas was born. I retired from where I'd been working for the last uh, 25 years, the company that John Matthias started. He ended up selling to us employees. We, in turn, ended up selling it to bigger conglomerates. I was just a programmer there and continued working up to the time I retired. And it was like God tapped me on my shoulder and said, you are not retiring, you are redirecting. And so it was. And as you saw, that was the pictures from the first year. That was 2018. The biggest book IP you've never heard of, 22 books in the series, 30 million copies, New York Times adult bestseller list for, for all young adult crossovers. Number one. Harry Potter, ever hear of that one? Number three, Lord of the Rings. Have you ever heard of that one? Okay, what's your answer for number two? If you picked Redwall, you're right. What the heck is Redwall? <coughs> there was a book series, and there still is, and Everything I said there was true. Why isn't it more widely known? Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, both have had major motion pictures. Redwall hasn't. Though I just heard that Netflix is now doing a Redwall movie. The reason it's been so difficult to do is there's no people in it. All the people roles are woodland creatures. So that makes, makes filming it kind of difficult. So we'll see what Netflix does with it. But in any case, at CGDC, I met a fellow um, who was, turned out, was a fan from long ago with the TI, because he had a TI. And he also had managed to land the IP for Redwall for computer games, and was in the process for the last year of doing a, a Redwall game. And we got together and came to the conclusion, maybe we can do a Redwall text adventure to fit in. And the game is called Escape the Gloomer. It's currently done and for sale. 
You can find it on Steam. You can find it on iOS. You used to be able to find it on Android, but thank you very much, Google. They have put a big wrench in the works because they said, this is a game for kids, therefore you can't sell it. Wait, wait, no. We said it's not a game for kids. Yes, we know, but because it has cute woodland creatures in it, it's a game for kids. <laughs> That's their logic. Um, very proud of it. My team and myself did an incredible job. I recommend it to you. It's family friendly. It's enjoyable. It's got a built-in help system. Um, unlike all my other games, it makes some things that are very different. You are not playing the game. You're writing a novel. Literally, everything you do creates that novel. And you're writing a parallel story to the second book in the Red uh, Redwall series called um, Mossflower. The first book is called Redwall in the series. The next book is called Mossflower, and it's a prequel. So it's actually before Redwall in the series. So if you're going to read something, you really should read Mossflower first. But in any case, it's available, it's out, and it's available. I think I said that. Sound familiar? Whoa. OK, spring forward. 2018, we get the game out. It's done. What do we do next? Well, let's wait for the royalties to roll in, and then we're going to start the next game. Let's wait for the royal. It didn't sell. Gee, it's almost like there's no market for text adventures. Or we don't know how to reach the market. I don't know. All I do know is it didn't sell. It's still not really selling. Which, very hard to run a company. We did the entire work for Redwall on my life savings. It's all gone. We invested everything into it. And I do not regret one penny of it. Because I honestly feel God said I was supposed to be doing it, and I did it. And so whatever happens is, is to his glory, and I'm OK with that. But it wasn't good for the company, or so it seemed. I went to prayer and fasting. I didn't know what else to do. We were in the dregs of the bank account. We literally got a gift from one of the employee's mother to make payroll. That's, that, was, that was it. We were, we were down to the end. After coming up on, off my knees after a season of prayer and fasting, I get a call. I don't have fans on the internet. I have friends. Anyone who's ever reached out to me on the internet, on Facebook or email or whatever, I have connected with them as a person. I want friends. I do not want fans. Anybody who comes to me and puts me on the pedestal has got to change that outlook right away. So I have a lot of friends out there. One of them reached out to me and said, I work for a small company in Tennessee, and they've decided they'd like to go into the video gaming industry. And does anybody here in the company know a game designer? <laughs> and I raised my hand. <laughs> and he gave my name to them. And I contacted them, and we talked. And it was kind of amazing. What they wanted to do was an interesting game, and they were, they were not just talking to us, they were talking to others. They were going out for bids. <clears throat> so with my handful of staff left, we put together a prototype. I had one fellow with us. He was, he was a um, graduate student that was uh, working for us part-time who knew Unity, C-sharp, well enough. He said, I can put together a simple demo of what they're talking about, just to get a feel for it. I said, cool, we'll put that in with the estimate. And that's what we did. We gave them the estimate, and we gave them the prototype game, and we waited. 
And that week, it didn't take long, they said they had a company meeting, they went through all the bids, and it was unanimous that they were going to pick us. This was summer of 2019. Been working on it now two years. Uh, we estimate we have another two years' work still. They are an incredible company. They are not a Christian company any more than Clopas is a Christian company. Because you, how do you define a Christian company? What does that mean? But we are two companies that are run by people who believe in Jesus. The owners believe in Jesus, but we're not a Christian company. So we, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of looking for God's plan for something. And we've been working closely together. The game is out there. You can play it now. It doesn't cost anything. It's free to play. It gets monetized other ways. Uh, it's finalpilot.com. I don't have a demo up, but you can play it in any browser. Um, and there's also a Windows desktop version, and it's also available on Steam. A lot of people seem to like the Steam version. And once again, there's no charge to play it. Just need a Steam account. And it's getting betterer and betterer. It really is. The features that uh, they keep coming up with are amazing. Um, they do 80% of the de design. We do 100% of the programming. And it is, it's just awesome. It's been myself and a, a team of, of uh, others that have worked with me on it. It's kept Clopas going. Why, I don't know. How long it's going to go, I don't know. But God opened the door when we needed it, and it has been amazing. Another thing that's going on is Adventureland XL. For those of you that remember the classic game Adventureland, we're doing a version of Adventureland, and it's available now too. It's only on early release on Steam, um, so it's not on other platforms, just Windows, plat Windows right now, Steam. And it is basically the entire Adventureland game plus. The XL stands for extra large, and it also stands for 40, Roman numeral, because it's the 40th anniversary. Where did the time go? Wow. Try it out, see what you think. And if you don't like something, or you like something, let us know, because it's in early access for a reason. We're trying to make it better. Right now, it's, the game is complete end to end, except for the final scene. That has not been fully fleshed out or decided. Um, it's got, like I said, the whole original game, and then something new and special that's as big as the original game was. So. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want you to try it and form your own impressions. If you think you know the game, even the base game's got a few surprises for you that I'm not going to tell you. You'll, you'll see them soon enough. Um, the extended version of the game has one of the most interesting puzzles I've ever done. I think the solution to it is unique. Um, but that was just my take as a puzzle designer. I think it's fair, and when you, it's one that you'll Noodle over for a long time unless you use the help system, which you can. But if you don't, once you do finally get it, it'll be like, aha, of course. And I think those are the most satisfying puzzles. When, when you finally get it and, and you feel accomplishment. But anyway, it's a, it, it is available. <clears throat> and take a look at it. We moved the company. Uh, for a while, it started out in our basement, uh, Shades of uh, Adventure International starting. It was also started in the house in a spare bedroom. Then we moved to uh, a large room we have in the house that was designed for an indoor pool, an 18-foot indoor pool. It was our indoor pool. Um, when Constant gets chilly in the winter, it's hard to get out to the pool. <coughs> so we had an indoor pool that was heated when we expanded the house a little bit. As the company grew, we took the pool, kicked it outside, and put the company inside. So all those pictures you saw flying around earlier was the company in that room. Now we're in a business incubator um, in town, uh, going into our second year there, and it's been a great facility. This picture is not even currently up to date, but it's approximately the size staff that we currently have. Graphic.
And if you think about it, to me, the, the um, character in the center is the true superhero. So he has certainly saved my world. <clears throat> By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. This is my inheritance, and this is my story. To follow where he leads, and he led me here today. What an amazing journey this is turning out to be. Any questions? Now, everybody stand up. Turn to a friend. Turn to somebody. And clap for them. <laughs> we each have a gift. We just need to use it to God's glory. None of us is any better than any one of us. No questions? We have a question? Yes? You were talking about uh, Adventureland when you first wrote it. Uh, what language did you write it in? Um, the bass language was basic, because I was learning to use basic strings. But I invented my own language on top of the basic so that I could write my games. And that my, was my adventure language. We had one fellow here, Ethan Dix. I don't know if he was able to make Ethan here. There he is. He is one of five people in the world that were able to take my interpreter, take it apart, and learn the language. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you. He did it when he was 13. So uh, <laughs> you talked about being, like, during the great video game crash of 83, and a lot of people saw the NES as being like what pulled us out of that. So when the NES came out, did you have any thoughts or like hopes or maybe this would be the savior or did you just think it was done and gone? I'm sorry, I, I am hard of hearing, I've got hearing aids and I didn't catch all of that. No, that's fine. Um, so you talked about being like in the great video game crash of 1983 yes. and your company went down. Yes. A lot of people uh, saw the NES when it came out in America in 85. It's like what pulled us out of that. Okay. Did you have any, like, when you saw it, did you have any hopes or did you just think that it was? Once I was out of the industry, I thought that part of my history was done. Door closed, wasn't anymore. I had a full time job as a programmer for aerospace and that was it. I, I was going to go out and do anything like this ever again. So it was the end. Well, that's how I felt. I was a failure. I was a um, Tom Pittman, one of the, um, I think he worked on a version of Mini Basic or something, or he, he worked on Basic. Um, he has an essay that he wrote called Deus Ex Machina, okay. the true computerist. Okay. And it's about um, the idea of, in creating uh, programs or games, the programmer analogously takes this position of um, the creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. Mm -hmm. he, I think he's, he has a religious uh, identity, Christian identity, and he talks about Interesting. The um, I I just wanted to know if you had read not that heard essay. Of that. No, this is this is new to me and fascinating. I could send that to you if you want. And, a, and he wrote Pittman Basic. Uh, he worked on I uh, a version of Basic at one point in the history. Because the name does sound familiar, fascinating. Deus ex machina is um, God. In, so that's God from the machine, which is interesting. It, it was an essay that uh, was mentioned in Stephen yeah. Levy's book, I think. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That's something I, I would like to look up. 
Hey Scott. So if hey I'm Stuart, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a long distance friend I never got to meet, and now I did here, and I want to say to the hosts of this event, thank you for. I've met a lot of people here, only been able to correspond with, and I really appreciate that. Sorry, Stuart. And so do I, by the way. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the UK subsidiary of AI lasted quite a lot longer than the parent. Yeah. I think it's still sort of around in some aspect. I'm not sure about that. It might be. That but, is possible. What, so given you're aware of that, did that give you any you know, comfort that the legacy was still going on to some extent? Or did I do care? know I, I get a lot of um, interest from uh, people from UK. Uh, I was interviewed for a documentary that I think is supposed to go out on the BBC. I don't know if that's that's happened yet or going to. Um, but there is a, a, a large number of people in the UK that were exposed to my games and have good memories of them. And they had the rights to do UK and Europe. And so they, my games ended up being played from England to Italy. And of, of the two, it's interesting, I get a lot of responses from Italy too. It's like, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. You played my game as a kid in Italy. Don't you speak Italian? I mean, I, I didn't make an Italian version because I, I couldn't. I didn't know the language, didn't know how to. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we played your game because we had to learn English. <laughs> you mentioned near the beginning that, that you learned learned a lot by studying what others had done in, in electronics and programming and so on. Yes. Did you do that while working on your engines and your games? Did you look at competitors' engines or games like Infocoms, for example, and, and in the, since the UK was mentioned, they had, uh, was it level level nine? Uh, there, were a few, there were a few um, yes. well-known companies. Good question. Um, I made it a point not to look at their games. Um, the, I can think of only a handful of games that I looked at during that period that uh, I did look at. I didn't look at the code, but I played the game. One of them was Wizardry. And after losing a week, I decided I better stop doing this. <laughs> that really hooked me in. Uh, I knew about Infocom, of course, because I had played Zork um, uh, at Stromberg Carlson. They had gotten a copy of Zork there, so I was aware of that. But I hadn't, I wasn't shooting for a Zork type experience because the 16K wasn't going to let me do that. Um, you should see the language that is built out of the Zork interpreter. Yeah, I've, I've heard about that. Zill. Yes, it's yeah. Telegram. Yeah, Thomas was saying you should see the language it was bought, bought yeah, built, built on, built on uh, the Zill language. And from what I remember, they worked on uh, using a deck to do their, yeah. their compiles and builds. So they, they were a very forward-looking uh, company. Um, Mike Berlin, I believe, was part of that. I think later on, some of my employees went with Mike. Uh, I think Russ Whitmore went with Mike to do some uh, amazing efforts, too, in other areas. But for myself, personally, I tended only to take brief glances at it. Um, I did not play adventure games from others, because I, did, I really didn't want to accidentally steal a puzzle. I wanted any puzzle that I was doing or thing that I was doing to be coming internally and not uh, as a, a blatant ripoff. And I figured the safest way to do that is don't look at it. So I didn't. Um, I, the things that I learned, mostly my programming increased tremendously once Adventure was closed and I went to work in the real world and I researched good programming practices and learned things from other programmers. Uh, I later on, I became a scrum master. Um, I'm fluent in C-sharp. I'm learnt, I, very strong in Unity now. I love that, love that system. So I'm always willing to pick up and learn things from others. I just don't want it to, um, I don't want it to affect any work that I'm doing that I'm trying to do that's original. It's a good question. Um, so you've been involved in publishing and distributing games for some time, and there's been changes, especially with things like Steam, where now it's so easy to issue you know, patches and fixes all the time. But could you comment on how, you know, back maybe in the 80s, what it felt like 
when the user would report a bug and, and how you would respond to that. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Um, if you look at my adventure games, you will find inside, there's a version number. And not every game you get has the same version. So yes, those bugs did get reported, and yes, they got fixed, just not retroactively. <laughs> so sorry if you're stuck with a bad bug. Um, unfortunately, Escape the Gloomer has one major bad bug in it, that if you do one certain thing, you can mess up so you can't complete the game. And I can't fix it, because that game is sealed and done and out. Um, though there's a built-in debugger in the game, a hidden secret debugger, that we can direct the user how to turn it on and fix the problem themselves. <laughs> There's also a hidden secret, I think it's in Spider-Man and on too. I built in my debugger into the language. Good question, thank you. Right, that's it, thank you. Okay. Right on time. We had this for you all week.